welcome to the Everyday Millionaire Show with Ryan Greenberg and Nick Calpis. All right, guys. We're <laughs> welcome back to another episode of the Everyday Millionaire Show. We're here with Alex Sonkin, take two. Uh, sorry about that, Alex. We had to uh, press record. What did you, you think of that? So <laughs> we... Um, to get started, we'll just do a quick little debrief. Nick and I are both real estate investors based out of Baltimore. Um, I own a portfolio of rentals and manage uh, about 145 properties and uh, do a couple million dollars a year in general contracting work. Uh, so that's our that's my background. And then Nick? So I'm a buy and hold investor here in Baltimore. I own about 80 units. I've been investing for five years and I primarily do the Burr method, which is buy a distressed property that needs some renovation, renovate it, rent it, refinance it, and then essentially repeat that process over and over again. Got it. That sounds awesome. It's going to be a fun conversation. Yeah. So from what I gathered, you're a tax guy. I'm a, I'm a tax guy. Yeah. So um, we do, we, uh, I'm the founder of the due diligence project, virtual family office hub, Name is Alex Sonkin. My background um, used to be an options trader. I was a member of the Chicago Board of Trade, the Chicago Mercantile Exchange, Chicago Board of Options Exchange. This was back in the 1990s, early 2000s. Um, married a school teacher. Her mom was going through cancer. My aunt survived cancer with this macrobiotic diet. Uh, I suggested that my mother-in-law try this diet and uh, it worked. So she cured her cancer. My aunt cured her cancer. And she, my mother-in-law started cooking these cookies and pies with these macrobiotic ingredients. And I recommended that my wife and her start a company called uh, that, that would sell these products. It's now called Go Macro. So if you're ever in Whole Foods or Trader Joe's or pretty much any grocery store, you'll see these macro bars. They're uh, super healthy nutrition bars. And the company's doing uh, this year, we should get close to about 150 million in sales. Uh, we have no investors. PepsiCo has been trying to acquire us and we're the leading protein and energy bar company out there. Um, and we've built a huge following of just people that are really love to eat delicious foods that don't cause cancer. So that's go macro. If you ever seen, have you ever, ever seen macro bars? You guys macro are too big. Bars. Well, I've never seen them, but that, that sounds pretty awesome. So where are you based out of? I, I don't think we got that. Yeah, I'm out of, we're out of Southern California. We live in San Diego. Uh, Go Macro's facility is located in, in Wisconsin. We're from, I'm from Chicago. I used to be an options trader. I was a member okay. of the trademark and CBOE. So my in-laws, they, they decided to buy a farm up in Wisconsin. And the idea was hatched on that farm and the facility. We have a, a 80,000 square foot facility in the middle of nowhere in Southwest, South Central Wisconsin, a little city called Viola. What I do for a living um, is I run a company called the Due Diligence Project, Virtual Family Office Hub. We have hundreds and hundreds of CPA firms and family offices that we support. In 2020, we had 847 CPA firms participate in something called the Due Diligence Project Summit. And what we do is we eat the, the elephant known as the United States tax code, we eat it as a community because no one knows how many pages there are in it. No one knows how many strategies are involved. And what we found is that only 18% of Fortune 500 companies are able to zero out their tax returns. When we look at multi-billion dollar family offices, the billionaires in this country, people worth hundreds of millions of dollars, um, we find the same kind of percentile, less than one out of five billionaires really has a tax return that we would consider to be pristine. The other four out of five, even though they can hire the best CPA firms and law firms in the world, those CPA firms and law firms have no idea how many pages there are in the tax code. They have no idea how many strategies there are to mitigate taxes. And they're just left with offering their clients very traditional planning ideas, which create very traditional results which are not very, which are not simulated to the kind of results they're creating in terms of, terms of income and net worth. So their tax planning is like a, at a D level and their income and net worth are at an A level. Whereas like people like Zuckerberg and Bezos, their income and net worth are at an A level and their tax planning is also at an A level. And so that's what we're trying to do is we're trying to bring in those A level tax solutions and strategies 
to millionaires and centimillionaires, and we do it through a network of CPAs. And the way we do it is we just allow hundreds and hundreds of CPAs to introduce their favorite resources into our community, and everyone independently vets out those strategies and resources. It's very similar to what Amazon does and what Netflix and the other streaming services do, right? Before Amazon and Netflix, how did we buy products and watch movies, right? You guys are maybe too young, but there's a company called Blockbuster Video. Before Netflix, you have to go to Blockbuster and flip old, flip these videotape covers and read the back and go, I wonder if I'm going to enjoy watching this with my girlfriend today, you know? And if you couldn't figure it out, what we would, you know, due diligence, be like, hey, I'm going to talk to the guy behind the counter at Blockbuster and maybe talk to the people in the aisles to see if they watch this movie. And what were we doing? We were doing a little bit of independent peer review. Did you watch this movie? Did you like the movie? So, you know, we got maybe three or four votes. Well, Amazon has done what? Netflix has done what? We're going to have millions of people watching these movies, buying these books, buying these products, rating them, ranking them. And when we go to Amazon, when we go to Netflix, the first thing we really see is the independent peer review, 4.9 stars, you know, eight out of 10 stars, you know, 96 percentile. There's a 96 percent chance my wife and I are going to watch this show, right? That's what we do. So what we're doing for the CPA community is doing the same thing, but we're taking the tax code and hundreds of strategies and using a community of tax focused CPAs. We don't rely on financial advisors, estate planning attorneys, real estate people. Those people have very little experience in audit and tax court. They don't know what happens with audit. They don't know what happens with tax court. CPAs are the ones who have to sign the tax returns. So building an independent community of CPAs you know, we have 10 former partners of KP, you know, big four to KPMG, Deloitte, PwC. They're able to introduce their favorite resources and independently vet out, ask millions of questions. And when they ask their questions and they get their questions answered, they feel comfortable. So being able to house all the notes, the Q&A, all the high level notes that we've been compiling over the last 15 years and then sharing it with the new CPAs that join our community it reduces their time by 10 times and gives them 10 times more confidence because they're able to interact with other CPAs. They're able to interact with the thought leaders, with the tax attorneys who develop the strategies, ask them their questions, ask other CPAs their question, and then go into the tax code, talk to the other people, and then complete their due diligence with massive confidence and actually complete it in 10 times less time because what we're seeing is the majority of CPA firms and law firms really don't do a lot of due diligence on tax planning. They just don't know who to call. They don't have the time and they don't know where to go when they see a new tax idea and they, they can't get their arms around it successfully and then bring it to their clients without this kind of community. So do things change uh, state by state when you guys are uh, running you know, the tax strategies for different individuals that are located in different areas? They really don't, you know, the strategies themselves are, you know, it doesn't matter what state you live in, you know, we have access to hundreds of strategies, obviously each client, each uh, end user is going to be, have a customized strategies to their specific fact patterns. So, you know, someone who is selling appreciated real estate, for instance, um, and doesn't want to do a 1031 and wants to, I just want a pile of liquidity now. Well. Where do we go for that, right? What can we do? Well, we can do it, do a structure where we defer that. Let's say you have a property that's worth $5 million. You got a base of a million dollars, you have a $4 million gain. Are you ready to pay some tax on that? Probably not. You're probably gonna sell that thing and 1031 it. But at some point, you're gonna want a pile of cash and spend it because your wife wants you know, that second home and third home and they don't wanna rent it out. And want, and you're, you've got this net worth now, you want it pretty. So what can we do? We can defer the tax for 30 years in the future, give you 93.5% of the value of that asset right now, take a small portion of the taxes saved, maybe, and, and figure out how to maybe finance a life insurance policy and use that life insurance policy benefit to take care of that future tax liability. What's even better than that uh, is partnering with a charity. And we have structure that Zuckerberg is using, Bezos is using, my family's using, uh, a lot of billionaires have this set up where they could basically, you know, Zuckerberg and Bezos didn't pay, you know, they're not paying tax on the appreciated Facebook stock and Amazon stock that they're selling. 
someone selling an appreciated piece of real estate can basically use a charitable holding company strategy, eliminate 99% of the tax in the sale of that asset, and then be able to invest those funds 99% tax-free moving forward and make small distributions to a charity partner, finance a life insurance policy, and take care of that charity partner at the end of the day and create a humongous tax arbitrage and be able to invest the difference or sp and or spend the difference as well. So I have a question. So actually, we were just we were kind of just talking about this um, before, and we we did my business did an extension this year, um, and we're trying to figure out basically what's a good number to get to in claims. So then, because I used to have a W two job, now I don't anymore, and it's much more difficult to get non you know um, we we usually do DSCR loans, so like debt coverage stuff when we go to get traditional loans, it's a pain in the butt right. because our CPA was obviously, you know, making it so we have write-offs and this and that, whatever. But it kind of comes back to bite us when we're trying to go to the bank and get a traditional line of credit. Yeah. And they're like, well, you, you didn't make any money. And I'm like, well, we bought all this real estate and we do have cash flow from it and this and that, but, but on the tax returns, that's not, that's not what it says. So what kind of strategy do you have for that that's a, you know that's that's a function of you guys you know you you guys first of all congratulations on getting out of your w-2 situations and building the, these incredible businesses in real estate you know that's awesome you guys are young guys and you're killing it and you're way well on your way um there are many lenders non-traditional lenders that really understand the non-traditional world that we live in and there's many lenders out there that also appreciate excellent tax planning. And so a good lender will look at your situation and say, look, you have this kind of liquidity, you have this kind of revenue, you have this kind of income, your type of business is naturally creating very large tax deductions, but you have the liquidity, you have the income, you have the cash flow to justify this loan. So these traditional lenders are using really old school numbers, you know, the point of the story is that's not our facility. That's not what we do. There are many lenders out there that would love to work with you too, um, that understand your, your parameters and understand that good tax planning is really an asset to the lender and to you. Yeah. So I guess I just got to get another, go look for some more lenders because the banks that I talk to, I mean, even my own bank, and this is, it's so frustrating. I had, you know, multiple six figures in an account trying to get a loan that's a $450 payment per month. And they said that I don't have, like, I, I can't. And well, I, I almost had to get a co-signer on it. And I, I ended up get working it out. But it was like the fact that I could have bought this thing five or six times and they weren't going to give it to me because of whatever underwriter said that, you know, your tax it, returns it, don't it, look it good. Makes no sense. It's not even logical. It's not even logical what they're doing. No, you, there's plenty of lenders out there. And the other thing, Ryan, is obviously, I don't know when you try to get this loan, but timing is timing's everything. You know, time you guys are you guys are successful real estate guys, so you know that timing is important. Right? Location, location. What's more important, location or timing? I don't know. Maybe timing, right? Yeah. As a trader, I would say timing is like they're both hand in hand. If you if you miss one and you hit the other one, you could lose all your money. Uh, you got to hit both. So right now, lenders are, are under massive stress, right? You know, you've got this yeah. whole SVB, you've got these banks, they're scared to lend, right? Because what if they're wrong? And so there's this other underlying thing that's happening right now. I think that lenders are just constricting what they're doing in general. And this is not specific to you or anyone else. They're just thinking, we're not going to get our money back. Because yeah. we get a bunch of loans with low interest rates. And a lot of these loans are going bad. So, so do you think that just to, to go off on a little tangent with the, like the SVB thing, like, do you think that there's going to be more banks that follow suit and just start falling? Or do I you think know. that that was like a, like a, you know, kind of, you don't a, want to know, listen, you know, my job is, it doesn't really matter what I think. Um, I, 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 I'm a scaredy cat, right? So I created the due diligence project because I don't know the future. And what I want to do is, you know, I have opinions about that, right? But
But what we're really, really good at is taking a tax strategy and going, okay, what's, first of all, what's the ROI in this tax strategy? That's easy, right? That's, that's the numbers. And then what's tricky is how much risk does this tax strategy have? So I can create wealth every day, every year by helping clients with tax liabilities, eliminate their income taxes by having hundreds of independent CPA firms review the tax strategy and, and actually tell us what is the risk of audit? What is the risk of tax court? How do we defend this thing? Are we comfortable knowing that these CPAs have zero interest in audit or tax court? They want to avoid risk at all costs, right? So we mitigate that risk by showing these strategies to 100 CPAs, and that's where we create results. You're asking me about what I think about the future of banking. I think it looks kind of scary, but I don't know. It, it doesn't look really good to me. So did you start your um, your career as a CPA, just like an independent CPA or? No, I, so I, I, I graduated University of Michigan business, undergrad business school, the BBA program over there in 1994. And my first job was for a French bank called SACGEN, Societe Generale. It was at the time the 16th largest bank in the world. It's still probably out there. And I got a job in the Chicago bond option trading pit working for the SOC Gen bond option desk. So they put me on the floor in the Chicago Board of Trade, paid me a salary, paid me benefits, and taught me how to make markets and trade options. I don't even think that job exists anymore. So it's a really, really cool, cool gig. And so from there, I worked for former guys who worked for Swiss Bank. Um, and in Chicago, that was kind of the center of the universe for option trading uh, on futures. And that's kind of the center of option trading in the whole world before everything went digital and went off the floor. And that's where all the arbitrage stuff was happening is, is in Chicago. So that was my beginning. Um, and then from there, I just realized I really liked riskless profit, which is arbitrage. And the idea of doing it in, in tax planning, that came about maybe 10 years later after I left the floor, started setting up family offices, started interacting with attorneys and CPA firms and started putting on events. And we would start putting on events for CPAs and bring in attorneys, bring in specialists. They would talk about various investment programs, various tax planning stroke programs. And what I noticed was in the hallways of those events, when the CPAs and the attorneys were interacting and doing their little Q and A, um, that's where the magic was happening. So we're like, wait a minute, when you put a bunch of elite CPAs and elite attorneys in a room together and give them some time just to chat, those conversations were gold. And then we realized the CPAs were like, they never even heard of most of the strategies that we were introducing to them. So I'm like, wait a minute, why don't CPAs know about all these strategies? Well, because they're so focused just on producing a tax return or doing, you know, helping clients with an audit or just doing the work that a CPA does, they're stretched so thin. They don't have time for any of this stuff but their clients need them to focus on the proactive tax planning ideas and they don't have any time and they don't know where to find these people. So we're like, we're here to fit, fill this massive hole of helping CPAs complete due diligence on sophisticated tax planning because they don't have time, they don't know who to call. And now with COVID, you know, when COVID hit 2020, all these CPA firms in New York, I mean, they didn't renew their leases. So all these $20 million building lease buildings in New York, they're not being released anymore. These CPAs didn't have a home. They're all over the place. So we went really, really big in 2020 with our events and said, look, this is your home. We have this global community of hundreds of CPA firms, law firms. You can come here, get access to due diligence, and get access to all these notes. And we're your global community that all we're doing is doing tax, you know, basically sophisticated tax planning due diligence on an independent basis. And the bigger, the biggest CPA firms and even medium-sized CPA firms, they're not doing anything like what we're doing. They're not doing independent peer review. So the C do they pay you, like the CPAs that are joining your thing, do they pay you directly? Yeah. And they part like a like part of a membership almost. Yeah, it's just a, a low membership fee. They're part of a community. They pay a monthly fee, um, and then they come in. But we, but they really do a lot of the work because they're the ones who are interacting with our CP, the, the specialists, and they're pushing them. They're asking a million questions, and sometimes what happens is 
they're, they're forcing tax attorneys to change their strategies. And all of a sudden now, these strategies that, that these attorneys come to us with, they become proprietary to our to the due diligence project, to the VFO hub, because our hundreds of CPA firms interacting with these attorneys, they're like, what if we did this? What if we did, wouldn't it be better if we did this? And the attorneys look at that and go, yeah, you're right. It would be better. Let's make, let's make that change. So they come to us with strategies and our CPAs, a lot of them have, you know, they, some of them have worked inside the IRS for a decade, two decades. Some of them have been, you know, partners at KPMG, Deloitte, PwC. These are experienced CPAs. So every experienced tax professional has something to offer because they bring something to the table, their, their background, they've been in audits, they've been in tax court. So they come and look at a strategy like, what if we'd added this and this and this and took away that? Wouldn't that be stronger from an IRS's perspective? That's the kind of stuff we're looking for. And that's what we're getting because that's what CPAs do. And our attorneys and specialists, if they can make those modifications, they will. And all of a sudden, these strategies become even stronger. So I have a question. So some of the greater tax strategies, do they come from a more like a federal tax code level to where everybody in all the states can um, yeah. utilize that strategy? And then they have yeah. separate ones for state level at a state level? Um, yeah. So some of some strategies actually, that's exactly right. Okay. But uh, some strategies handle income tax, estate tax, and asset protection and and all these other things on a state and federal level, they handle, and some strategies are just income tax focused or state tax focused. So we have access to hundreds of strategies, but really what we like to do is combine, sometimes combine two strategies or three strategies together to create something even better when it fits. Um, we typically focus on income, right? There's a lot of estate planning attorneys doing a lot of different stuff for estate planning, it doesn't really help the business owner, right? When you're dead, your family gets to avoid this huge estate tax. Great, I made all this money and now we've done planning and now my kids don't have to pay the estate tax. How does that help me? I don't know. Makes me feel better at night, I don't, I don't know. So we really focus on the income tax because that is something that really helps the business owner. And that's where most CPA firms, law firms, specialty firms, that's where they're really, really bad is how do we really mitigate income tax beyond the traditional planning ideas? And that's, and, and we look at strategies that are highest, you know, the highest ROI strategies, meaning we wanna eliminate federal and state income, and we want these to work everywhere. So really the question becomes how big is your income tax liability? And based on the size of the income tax liability and the consistency of it, if you have consistent income or it's just a one-time liquidity event, that's when we figure out, okay, where do we go? Which strategies do we start with? What's the good foundational strategy? Is there another strategy we could put on top of it to really minimize the income tax? And then what are the other goals? So typically clients have, besides income tax mitigation, they have other goals. Are they trying to retain employees? Are they trying to you know, build wealth? Are they getting going through a divorce? You know, everyone has a very, very specific situation. And then they have a bunch of goals besides income tax mitigation. So we look at those goals together and then decide which combination of strategies to start with. And then we work from there. So, so as just like a situation, as a high earner that wants to go talk to a CPA, um, and strategize about their business, you know, business owner, their high earner, what is an important or what are some important questions that they should be asking those CPAs when they get there? And, and vice versa, what is that CPA going to ask that you should be ready for if you're a high earner walking into that office? Look, there, the, 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 the range of CPA, we, you know, I have dealt with thousands of CPA firms, right? So we do, right now we're dealing with a thousand CPA firms just that we deal with, but we've met maybe 10,000 CPA firms. <laughs> There's like 2 million out there. Um, meeting 10,000 CPA firms over the last decade, the, the range and quality of service is, is humongous. The top CPAs are very different from the bottom CPAs. They're just thinking very differently. And even if you take a slice of the top CPAs, unless they're plugged in to an independent peer review community like ours, they're probably, it's like buying a really shiny cell phone. 
and it's plugged into Bob's telephone network. You know, you don't want to go buy a $10,000 gold-plated cell phone and, and literally plug it into some network that only gives you access. I only get a signal in like Idaho and New Mexico. Other than that, I get no signal. You don't want that. You want the network, right? So it's great to have an elite CPA, but what's even better is to have an elite CPA who's plugged into a network of hundreds of other elite CPAs who have access to all this due diligence and the notes so they can complete it really quickly and they have access to all the strategies. So if I were you, my first question would be like, are you doing any independent peer review? Are you, could, you know, what type of associations are you part of? Are you part of the due diligence project? Are you accessing all the best ideas out there? Or are you just limited to the traditional tax planning ideas that 80% of Fortune 500 companies are using and to get a tax return that looks like crap? Which kind of CPA are you? That's what I would ask, because that's that's what's meaningful to me. If I had a significant income tax liability, I don't want to waste time. I don't need to go to a fancy CPA who's got all sorts of stuff but no strategies because they don't have time for doing due diligence. Which well, is I, I guess the the question really is like, as a consumer, besides asking them, you know, are you part of the due diligence project? Are you part of a peer review? What like what signs? You know, like I went and looked for somebody that was real estate based. Like they do a lot of other real local real estate investors and business owners. That's how I picked my CPA. Um, is there anything else that you, you know, like that you should be no. asking as a consumer trying to figure out who is the best fit for your business? Like um, if I'm a, you know, Nick owns a landscaping business besides being a real estate, maybe there's somebody that specializes in service businesses or specializes in, you yeah. know, I think those are great. I think those are great questions. You know, I think you finding someone has a specialty in real estate, you being focused on real estate, that's a great place to start. The kinds of questions that they should be asking you is what are your goals five years from now? How can I help you to get to those goals? What is, do you have, you know, do you have a, a valuation of your current valuation of your business? You know, do you have forward looking financial statements? You know, the, this is a, pro, this is a, you want a forward looking CPA. You, someone says, let me see last year's tax returns. Okay. That's backwards looking, right? Is that important? Yes. Every CPA is going to ask you for last year's tax returns. That's not going to differentiate them. They all do that. But the ones who are asking you to forward looking statements who are really there, I mean, you want to really find out are how strong are they in sophisticated tax planning and proactive tax planning? And that's really a function of their curiosity. If you ask a CPA, do you know the tax code? Ask them, do you know the tax code? The answer should be no. I, I have no clue what's in the tax code. It's that big. If they say yes, run away. Because no CPA knows the tax code. They may know sections of the tax code really, really well, but no CPA knows the whole tax code. That's just insane. And a good CPA will tell you that right off the bat. Be like, I have no clue what's in that thing. It's crazy. But, you know, there's a couple sections there I know pretty well. And, I, I, and we know it enough to get your tax return done. But there's a level of humility that you, that you kind of have to approach the business with because it's, it's a very challenging business. And the more humble the CPA is, probably the better they are, you know, that's the best CPAs that I found are the humble ones who are quiet. They don't say a lot. They do a lot of work, but they don't want to get their firm in trouble. They're not going to get you in trouble. And they're before they recommend something to you, they're going to do a truckload of due diligence on it. And that's where they need the support. Whether And most of them don't even know that there's a, there's a due diligence project out there. They don't know that there's a community like ours out there. So they, they may have never heard of us. So if I were you and I'm starting out and I have never heard of the due diligence project or anything like that, I would get the best CPA I could and then introduce them to the due diligence project as soon as I heard of it and make sure they plug into it. And that way you have the best cell phone in the world that you can find that you want because you want to like this person. You want to be able to interact with them and you want them to be curious enough and humble enough to realize they have no clue what's in the tax code, even if they've been doing this for 34 years. And have them plug in the due diligence project. Now you get the best of both worlds. Now they have the community of resources to plug into. They're curious. They have a big heart. They want to do great things to you. They're humble. You connect with them on a, on a personality, social level. And this is a really strong relationship. And before you do anything, you should be 
letting your CPA know, hey, I'm looking to sell this asset. I'm looking to buy this other asset. I just want you to be aware of it in case there's ideas that you have for me to make this transaction more efficient. And you should be focusing every time you do a transaction, your CPA should be a, a partner in that conversation because sometimes people sell assets without talking to their tax, uh, you know, tax advisor. And then there's nothing. And then there, and then all of a sudden we could have done three things, you know, and now we can't do those three things. Now we can do only after sale strategies, which is going to limit us to three other things. So before we could do six things, now we can do only three things because you didn't talk to your CPA. So when you have a great tax partner, tax advisor partner, they become a big part of what you're doing. And in many cases, the tax savings alone could be a quarter or half the size of the total asset value that you've been building for 20 years. So I have a, I have a question. What are some good tax strategies to lower or eliminate uh, self-employment tax? Well, we don't have time to go through a lot of them, um, but we have all sorts of charitable structures. We have we have structures where you can invest, you know, a hundred thousand dollars and generate a four hundred thousand dollar tax deduction and own equity in a movie production facility. So you own a movie, equity in a movie, and you just got a four to one tax deduction. We have access to something like that. We have the the charitable the charitable partnerships that we talked about, um, we're helping clients eliminate sixty percent of their income tax on a yearly basis, and then house those funds in a structure that can grow ninety nine percent tax free. Um, there's a lot of other things we can do. It really depends on the specific size of the tax liability and then the goals besides income tax savings. Why do you think they make it so difficult for everybody to learn these strategies? Like, why does it take, you know, a thousand CPAs to break down this? Like, why do you, in your opinion, is all this stuff like not really known to the regular everyday person? You know, Too here's much information answer. for everyone, for every great, great point. Everyone listening to this, go Google the U S tax code and just start reading it. Just start reading it and, and try to make sense of any of it. It'll be like, okay, here's a rule. If you, you know, you can't do this. And then below that, unless, unless there, there'll be a million subsections, unless this happens or this happens or this happens or this happens. In that case, you can do that, but under these specific rules, and then you'll have to read like 30, 40 pages to understand when you can and can't do that. Yeah, like what? Why though? That's what I don't, I don't understand. Why it's so com why why they, why there's to be a, an army of people to read? Well, all, look, essentially legally, right? You have Congress who Congress is who their attorneys, right? Most of Congress are attorneys who do what? They are still partners in law firms. They are writing law, right? So that the law firms that they still have partnerships with can go out there and make money. Meanwhile, they're, they're doing tax planning. They're making huge investments. They have inside information. They're coming into the, coming into Congress worth a million dollars. They're, you know, what, a couple of years later, they're worth $400 million because they're doing insider deals. They want to be tax efficient. They go into the tax code and they utilize the strategies that they wrote the laws for that are in the tax code designed for them to legally avoid tax legally. So they have access to the best advisors who understand the tax code, who understand all these strategies, and they're implementing all these insider strategies that we really like to figure out ourselves and go, here's what all these insiders are doing. Here's what, you know, one out of five billionaires are doing the same thing that these Congress people are doing who are attorneys. This is what they're doing. This is how they're doing their own tax planning. Meanwhile, the way they're telling the world to do tax planning is completely opposite to what they're doing. So they're doing all the secret stuff that's in the right. tax. Now, that's what it seems like. If created a one pager, then this would be impossible, right? right. Nobody would pay taxes. Right. If, you, if they just made one pager and said, this is how, this is the tax code. It's one page long. It's very simple. Here are the rules. Can they do that? They could do that. Like they could just do that right now. So I, essentially what I hear is they just want to be fair, but they want to make it very difficult for people to get to that point to where they can take full advantage of the tax code. They're creating a back. Look, 
they it's like the internet, right? They created the internet. We have access to the internet, but someone has access to the back end of the internet. Who's that? I don't. Do you? Someone has access to it. So they created a tax code, right? We're doing. We're looking at this tax code. It's a million pages long. Going. I have no idea what the hell this is. I need to call my CPA because just like I said, no one, no one understands this thing. It is a bunch of gray area. So the it's basically like who has the strongest army is going to win this battle. But we don't fight our battles with, you know, with guys on horses and, and, and swords and, and, and ammunition anymore. We fight our battles with tax attorneys and tax advisors and, and CPAs and attorneys. So whoever has the strongest team of CPAs and attorneys is going to win this every single time because it's all gray area. And obviously, CPAs don't want to cross those lines and go in the gray area. But the point is there are so many strategies in the tax code where we don't have to get into the gray area by just being very meticulous. And there are plenty of advisors and plenty of specialists out there that take this work and they go to the nth degree. So like, remember in our, when you were in school, we were all in school, remember our you know, fourth grade, third grade class, there's 30 kids in the class, right? Let's just assume there's yep. 30 kids in the class. So the top two kids in the class are like the geniuses. You know, there's one or two kids in that class. They're going to MIT. They're going to Harvard. You know, then the bottom three, four, five kids in the class, they're probably going to be smoking in the hallways. They're going to be, you know, they're going to be doing drugs. They're on, they're on a bad road. Then they're in that middle, there's our middle 25 kids. What are they doing? They're just doing the best they can, maybe cheating off each other, do, you know, just having fun, messing around. They're not going to Harvard. They're not going to MIT. They're just getting through school. You fast forward now, where are, where's the, where are those 30 kids? They're in the workplace, right? You got the bottom four or five kids, they're in jail. The top two kids, those are the kids, those are the CPAs and attorneys you want. I want to find those top two kids, right? What are we getting? We're getting the middle 25 kids. That's the majority of attorneys and CPAs and advisors. That's, that's who we are. That's, that's America, right? So they're going on AI, doing all this stuff. Unless you have one of those top two kids from that class, you are getting very average to below average service in every area of whatever the hell you're hiring to do. And yeah. so it, it requires due diligence. And so the smartest people, the most successful people in the world, what they do is they build their companies, they build their family offices, and they, you know what they do? They go through their people, their employee list, they go through their advisor list, and they fire everybody unless they're an A or A plus player. I don't want any A minus, B plus, B, B minus, C plus players on my team. Because my organization is only as strong as the weakest link. So your organization is strong, is only as strong as your weakest link. And if your weakest link is a CPA, that's a huge problem. Yeah, that's a good point. I actually love what you just said there. Yeah. Yeah, no, that, that makes a lot of sense, especially somebody that, you know, is taking care of your entire finances, essentially. Because I, I guarantee you, you're not building your portfolio of real estate doing B minus work. In order to get 80 properties, right? In order to own 80 properties, you got to do A, A plus work. You can't, you're not just, oh, oh, by accident, we started doing real estate. Next thing you know, I own 80 properties. No, that does not, you and I both know that doesn't happen. Yeah. You worked, yeah. Your, you worked your ass off. You did a lot of stuff. You learned a lot of stuff. You made a lot of mistakes. You, you figured it out. You know, you want that, or you want someone like that in every area of support. And you want your CPA to be like that too. Like I'm turning over every rock, every leaf, looking for everything. I'm, I don't know the tax code. I'm gonna, you know, I'm, I'm humble, I'm working hard. I'm, I'm gonna find everything I can to help you mitigate your taxes. That's the kind of energy you want from your CPA. Okay, that's, a, that's good advice. So one thing that we ask every guest towards the end of the show is some goals of yours. So like a personal goal, maybe in your personal life, and then one for your business. If you can get, think of two off the top of your head, two goals that you have. You know, it's a great question. It's a great question. You know, um, my personal goals is to really focus on my most important relationships, which is, which is God. You know, I want to give back more to my faith. Uh, I do a lot of charity work. 
Uh, I want to increase that and really focus on my most important relationships with my family, my kids, my friends. Um, that's really important to me. As far as business goals, you know, I am, I'm, I'm I've been working really hard and I, I feel like I've hit, I've hit my goals, uh, which just taken me a long time to hit all the goals. And part of that was me writing down those goals, which is kind of the secret of, of hitting those goals is to write your goals down. But, you know, my personal goals is just to double, double my income, double my revenues, double my net worth so that I could give more give back more to charitable causes and be able to help others, you know, and then ultimately I think I'm at a point in my life where I really get a lot of great, get a lot of, you know, enjoyment from giving back and sharing my knowledge with others and helping just push people up um, and seeing them successful as well. Awesome. So do you have any, um, any other, like any, investments besides like your your businesses do you do you like invest in options now and stocks now or is there any strategies that you use from an investment standpoint you know i it's a great question so because we're working with so many very very successful people you know on the cpa side and then their clients and working with these family offices we really like to co-invest with some of the ultra high net worth clients, ultra successful clients that we work with on the tax side. So for instance, you know, we have billionaires who developed all sorts of crypto stuff who have, you know, leading platforms out there. And I've been able to invest like in the, their friends and family venture fund and see opportunities in crypto that most people are never gonna see because they're not at that level. Um, you know, and I, I don't have time to, be staking coins and doing all this other stuff. And I just want to invest at a very high level. And I'm able to do that through these family office partnerships. I really love what you guys are doing and I don't have time to manage a real estate portfolio. So I'm, in, I'm investing with groups who are doing, you know, multifamily housing, uh, senior living, either buying up, uh, you know, distressed properties and fixing them up or going in, go, you know, purchasing apartment buildings, um, right. Like syndications, syndications, things like yeah. that. You know, right now we're in a risky, basically residential, multifamily residential types of type. Of right. Assets. Yeah. Awesome. Well, Alex, it was a lot, a, a lot of stuff that I uh, is a little bit over my head. So I appreciate you breaking it down and and you know, kind of explaining what you guys do. And I think anybody that's listening, you know one of the questions that I'm going to ask my CPA is if he's plugged into something like this, because it would, you know, it makes sense to have a team of people looking at all this stuff, especially when we're talking about saving, you know, over the course of a lifetime, maybe tens of millions of dollars in, in taxes. So that is, um, yeah, super important. Alex, thank you. Uh, thank you for coming on. How can people get in touch with you and find you on social? It says here you have a, your own podcast. Yeah, I have a podcast, you know, people can, watch a bunch of my podcasts on the due diligence project.com due diligence project.com info at due diligence project.com is one of our emails. Um, that's how they can find me. They can also find me on LinkedIn, Alex Sonkin, S O N K I N on LinkedIn and uh, reach out to us that way. But that info at due diligence project.com is, is a great way to reach, reach us. Awesome. And if you go to due diligence project.com, you can watch the podcast. You can, there's a bunch of stuff up, up there that's uh, free for the public to review. Awesome. All right, Alex Sonkin, thank you so much for coming on. Thank you. Ryan and Nick, really appreciate you both. Thanks so much. Have a go in. Take care. Bye, guys.